chapter lessons in 10 minutes or less. I'm Jacob and today I just wanted to put out a short video that labels all of the forces that act on an airfoil. Now up to this point I've kept the airfoil terminology fairly simple but I think it's about time to just kind of expand this a little bit more and uh, show a little bit more detail. Now starting off with the basics we have our airfoil. So looking at just basic airfoil right here. Uh, they can come in either symmetric or asymmetric shapes each with their own different benefits. Uh, but from the leading edge to the trailing edge, we have a cord line. I'll talk about that in my other uh, video on the types of airfoils. But from the leading edge to the trailing edge, we have a cord line. Um, and now this is going to give us our baseline for how to measure a lot of the other forces in relation to the blade. Now as the rotor turns around the mast, it creates a rotational relative wind. This is generally perpendicular to the axis of a rotation uh, when the aircraft is level. So. What we have right here is the axis of rotation. So as the aircraft rotates around the mast, this is its axis of rotation, and now it's going to be impacting our rotational relative wind. Once again, axis of rotation, and I should have labeled it earlier, but here's our cord line. Alright, now this rotational relative wind, sometimes called as the, uh, the tip path plane, it's the, the path that all the blades follow around the mast. Now due to the fact that the rotor blades uh, follow each other along the same path around the mast with increases in pitch angle, it creates a downwards uh, flow of air through the, uh, through the rotor system. So the blades are actually experiencing induced flow or uh, downwash, induced drag, there's a lot of different names for it. But this acts on the airfoil, something like this, we're going to have our induced flow. Alright, so what's left over from this is going to give us a resultant relative wind. So if we were to draw this from right here, intersecting that, we're going to have our resultant relative wind. And just like the name implies, this is the result of the, uh, the relative wind uh, of the relative wind as we modify it for induced flow. Now it's from here that we can find things like our angle of attack, which is going to be where we get our lift from. Now our angle of attack, this is the angle between the cord line and the resultant relative wind, and it depicts the amount of lift that the airfoil is producing. So this is going to be the angle, like I said before, between the cord line and the resultant relative wind. So this angle right here is our angle of attack. This is our lift. This is where we're getting that lifting force on the airfoil. Now the difference between the cord line and the rotational relative wind is going to be our actual pitch angle. This angle of attack we don't directly affect, but this angle between the cord line and the rotational relative wind we do affect. So this angle right here is our angle of incidence. Now this is usually confused fairly often, the difference between angle of attack and angle of incidence, so I'll just kind of talk about that a little bit more. The angle of incidence is going to be a mechanical angle. We directly control this with collective and cyclic inputs. We are changing the pitch angle in the blade and adjusting this angle of incidence. The angle of attack is an aerodynamic angle, which is a product of our angle of incidence and our induced flow. So we may uh, want to increase our angle of attack, but we actually control it by our angle of incidence. Uh, by increasing that pitch angle, we adjust this angle, which then broadens this angle even more, potentially affecting the amount of induced flow depending on the flight profile we're in. But from here it's necessary to note that uh, lift acts perpendicular to the resultant relative wind. So what we're going to do, we follow this resultant relative wind all the way back, and just like the, uh, the forces with lift, weight, thrust, and drag, this is bringing it uh, opposite of the resultants, noting our drag vector, and then perpendicular to this we're having our lift vector. Alright, so from this lift vector, uh, this is where we're able to find our total aerodynamic force. So based on the two vectors between our drag vector and our lift vector, if we were to put those both together, we generate what's called our total aerodynamic force vector. Now this is uh, sometimes referred to as the resultant force, and it's generally uh, directed up and aft of the airfoil. Now you may notice that these angles over here are roughly the same as these angles over here. This is just an easier way to depict it. So we know of our lift and drag, you know, lift being generally up, drag generally being aft. Um, 
This is an easier way for us to identify where those lift and drag variables come from, whereas on this sort of side of the chart, it's kind of an easier method to depict how this airflow is actually impacting our airfoil. So just, it's the same angles that we're seeing right here, it's just depicted slightly different ways to explain different things. Uh, so as you notice right here, these differences in lift and drag, this induced flow right here, now being this induced drag right here if you want to calculate it for your, your lift and drag. But from here we have the basic structure of uh, the aerodynamic forces as they interact on the airfoil. Now if I say induced flow is increased without a change to angle of incidence, uh, it goes to say that that must be a reduction in angle of attack. So if this gets larger without this increasing, we're losing angle of attack. So in essence, we're losing lift. So what does this mean? This, was, this would be like if you were flying along in straight and level flight and then you decided to uh, stop moving in forward flight and just uh, make an approach to an out of ground effect hover without adjusting the collective. This induced flow is going to increase. If you didn't adjust collective, your angle of attack would stay right here. Your angle of, or your angle of incidence would stay right here. Your angle of attack would actually be reduced and you would not be producing as much lift. So you're going to note that the helicopter is falling. And like what I said before, angle of attack, we control this mechanically with our flight controls. So we need to increase this angle of attack in order to main, or increase our angle of incidence in order, in order to maintain our angle of attack. Uh, in order to continue flying and not fall out of the sky during this maneuver. Now, I don't expect every pilot to uh, actively think about this chart anytime you're doing a takeoff, but uh, it's good to understand these diagrams so that you can have a better understanding of how lift changes uh, when going through things like ETL or the differences in airflow at a hover, uh, especially the difference between, say, an in-ground effect and an out-of-ground effect hover. You know, some of my other videos show about how this induced flow angle adjusts. You have differences in angle of attack and the differences in angle of incidence. So this just kind of sets the framework for uh, depicting how the forces act on the airfoil. Uh, but that wraps up uh, this video. This uh, That concludes the forces acting on an airfoil. Thanks again for watching Helicopter Lessons in 10 minutes or less. Be sure to hit like and subscribe below, and as well as leave a comment if you enjoyed or if you didn't enjoy what you liked. Uh, once again, I'm Jacob. Thanks for watching and safe flying.